Hello everyone. Once again, we're, we're in a lockdown. And um, so you know, we're online, church online. And I have a question for you. Do you like waiting? Uh, I think that all of us would say, no, none of us like waiting. In fact, Priscilla was telling me this week that she was uh, had to take one of our kids to the doctor uh, and she called up beforehand, you know, trying to make sure that the doctor's running on time. They say, give it an extra 15 minutes, she gets there and you know what's going to happen. She ends up waiting for over an hour there and you know how frustrating that is. And I think that we've all been... We've all now in this time of waiting. The last year and a half, I think that's a, that's the thing we've been doing. We've been waiting for things to return back to normal. We're waiting for things to change. Where, you know, if you're, you're a believer, you're waiting on God. You're waiting for for an answer, a breakthrough, a revival. We're, we're waiting, and and how do we how do we process that? What what what? And I think that what we see in the world is that. In the world, we just don't get the resources that we need uh, to cope with waiting. Everything in the world, you know, tells us to get it now. Don't wait. <laughs> Buy now. Pay later. You know, uh, drive through. Uh, it's fast food. It's fast service. Everything is is driven towards getting it now. And I think so. We need to return to the Word of God and see, because the Bible is, amongst many other things. It has this narrative all the way through about waiting. Um, and you see this in one of the most pa- famous passages of Scripture is the Exodus. You know, 40 years in the wilderness. Um, they waited. Uh, they, they had to endure. They had to pace themselves. And so uh, the Scriptures have a lot to say about waiting. And this passage in particular today uh, is another famous passage. We're going to be looking at Lazarus. We're going to look at... Uh, over the next couple of weeks actually looking at Lazarus, looking at how Jesus raised him from the dead. And before we see how Jesus raised him from the dead, we we start the chapter in verse 1 through to 11 we're going to be reading today and it deals with waiting. What what do we do when God delays? And so uh, let me read that now. John chapter 11, verse 1 through to 11. Now a certain man was sick. Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. It was that Mary who anointed the Lord with fragrant oil and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore the sisters sent to him, that is Jesus, saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. When Jesus heard that, he said, this sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that he was sick, he stayed two more days in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to the disciples, let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, lately the Jews sought to stone you. And are you going there again? Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of this world. But if one walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. These things he said, and after that he said to them, Our friend Lazarus sleeps, but I go that I may wake him up. Uh, The first thing that we're going to look at is just the characters in this passage. We see... Uh, there are a few. Uh, there's Lazarus, there's Mary and Martha. And one of the things that we uh, get, the first, one of the first things, the details that John puts in here is, to, is a picture of how much this family love Jesus. And, um, and he points to what happens in John chapter 12, actually, where Mary breaks open this expensive jar of perfume and puts it on the feet of Jesus. And we... Uh, we know that this jar of perfume costs something like a year's wages and she's poured it out. So, And she, then she's done the amazing thing of, of wiping it with her hair and it's basically she's turned her hair into a towel and she's, she's got down on her hands and knees. She's, she's bowed herself before him and she's wiping it all up. And, 
And, and so what we have here is a picture of, of love and expressed in that, that she's taken her most precious valuable possession of the of the household and she's poured it out unsparingly she hasn't just undone the lid a little bit and poured it a little drink she's broken it open upon him and she's she's spent the whole thing on him she's, there's just no reserves of her love and of her affection of, of her, she, you know this is her safety net this is everything they would have relied upon if things came, were hard times they fell upon She's just got, said, I've thrown away plan B and plan C. I'm putting it all on you. I'm pouring it all out on you. And, and that is a measure of their love for Jesus. And so we've got, we've got to take note of that. Um, and then in saying that, what we, the thing that we're confronted with, I guess, in this text is that these people who love Jesus... Um, had Jesus in their home, we know in Luke chapter 10, they had him over, the, the famous passage of Martha and Mary, and they served him and they sat at his feet. Uh, the, the thing that we're confronted with is that the, despite all of these things, um, a sickness still had come to their home, and, and a terrible sickness, and, and a sickness for which they were completely worried. That they could see that this wasn't going to turn out well unless God intervened in it. And, well, I think that says something to us, doesn't it? Um, that we can love God and still have things happen in our life and, and be put in this various positions. They then go on and they, they, they go out to send word to Jesus. And, and obviously it takes a little bit of time to send word to him. They didn't have Instagram. They didn't have uh, text message service. So they, they've had to send someone to Jesus. And they get there and they tell the Jesus, they say, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. And that's the second thing that we see in the next character we get introduced to is Jesus. And he's introduced as the Lord. And, and what we notice about Jesus is that he loves them. Um, they are able to come to him saying, we have word from Mary and Martha. Uh, the one whom you love is sick. And the thing that strikes me is that they didn't ever mention his name, you know, at least in this passage. You know, they didn't say Lazarus, whom you love is sick, but just by simply saying, We've come from Mary and Martha and they're saying the one whom you love is sick. Immediately Jesus knew they're talking about Lazarus. This points to the type of love that he had for them. It was personal, it was specific, it was relational. Um, he already knew who they were talking about. And in verse 5 it tells us that Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. Uh, so we see this is incredible love. I think one of the things that I think hits us is in times of waiting, um, do we know how he feels about us? You know, do we know that he loves us? Um, this is a, a big factor. I think one of the things that I sense that we may struggle with is in times of waiting when we're not getting the answers, the question comes into our mind, does he love us? Does he care? Um, is he for us? Those sorts of questions come to mind. And what this text shows us is that he does love us. He, he loves us abundantly. <laughs> he, he has a great sense of love for us. He, I want to even say that Jesus feels, has a feeling, has a, you know, he's moved within himself towards us. Um, and this is striking, I think, because it just cuts across every other sort of distant or... Um, sort of unresponsive view of God that we could have is that his distance somehow remote, he's not moved within him. But I think that this passage, particularly later on, we see that the shortest verse in the Bible, many people know it, Jesus wept. You know, uh, he, he is moved um, within himself. But this text is going to teach us something uh, very important and, and it's something that we, I think, are going to benefit greatly from. Because in verse 6, verse 5 told us he loved them. Verse 6 tells us that when he heard that he was sick, he stayed two more days where he was. <laughs> so, 
So Jesus absolutely loves Lazarus, absolutely loves this family, absolutely loves you, absolutely loves me. And yet there is times when he delays. <laughs> and, and, and this is the thing that I think we grapple with is I think we put love and time, you know, saying that, you know, time somehow um, correlates to to love. And again, I said, I think this is a cultural thing. It may be even beyond culture. It may be just a human thing, maybe just a, a people thing, is that we we have been become so conditioned to believe that you can have uh, that love is quick. <laughs> you know, uh, <laughs> we we want quick love. Don't wait till you're married. You know, you can get quick. You can get satisfied now. This, you, you go and do it now. We have married at first sight. We have speed dating. We have all these things that are, uh, are telling us you can get it today. You, you never wait. You know, that is kind of the mantra of our times is don't wait. Um, but what we find in God is a, is a, is a slow love, is, is a love that 1 Corinthians 13 tells us is that love is patient. <laughs> My version says love suffers long. You know, there is this sort of love, this soaking love. This, I, I compare this sort of love to like a tree. You know, you want that tree to spend time to go down. It goes down into the into the soil, you know, its roots going down ever deeper, ever further, and it's growing slowly, but it's growing surely. And, and the reason why this becomes so important is because when the sun comes out, scorching sun comes out, and when the wind blows and when the storm prevails, the, the tree that has got its roots down deeper it stands, it remains, it, it's, a, it's grown slowly, but it's grown strong, it, it's grown sure. And Jesus tells a parable that he compares to the word of God being much, the, much like this, that the things that spring up quickly, um, when the sun comes out, they're scorched, they wither away quickly. Um, how I, I want to stay with this a little bit longer because we see that Jesus does delay, and this is an issue for us, but I, I want us to see that it is not because he does not love us. It is because he knows more than us. <laughs> um, look at the, the next, the verse 4. It says that when Jesus heard that Lazarus was sick, he said this, this sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God. Um, that the Son of God may be glorified through it. See, Jesus, we don't, the two things that we're struggling with, we don't know really how much he loves us. You know, we've got to know how much he loves us. There has to be an experience. There has to be something personal. That has to be something that's ingrained in our heart, not just something, some sort of simple notion or some sort of sentimental idea of his love or some sort of religious um, formula of his love. I, I've got to know his love so personally, so inwardly that his love invades my soul and it, and it encourages me, it gives me courage in my times when I'm feeling down, that love comes to me again and again. Um, I've got to know that it is, nothing can separate me from that love. I've got, I've got to drive these scriptures deep into my heart. Love has to be personal. But one of the things that I think what we probably struggle with is because secondly, um, we don't know what he knows. I think, once again, our culture doesn't help us with this. Our culture wants us to think that we know more than what we know. It's, I think th this time that we're living in is called the information, information age. You know, it's, it, we just have such access to information. You just jump anywhere online and you'll find out pages and pages on anything that you want to know. <laughs> um, if you get a, a rash on your skin or something, you can just get on Google and you look it up. You know, you, you can just find all this information. But the thing is, all of those, Jesus has information about the future. Jesus has information about ultimate realities. You see here, he knows um, that this is going to lead to glory. It is a good uh, chance that when Jesus is saying this, 
that Lazarus is very close to death. If not, he has already died by the time he gets this message. And so when Jesus says this sickness is not unto death, what we realize is that what Jesus is saying is that it's not going to have its final say. It's not the, it's not the, uh, it's not the title of this book. You know, this book is not going to end this way. This is not the main point of the, the thing, but no, death will not win. And he goes on to say, it is for the glory of God. I want to compare this to, uh, uh, you know, as parents, we have our children. And, you know, if you're like me, I mean, you just, you just love your kids. <laughs> you love them. You know that you'd give yourself for them. You know, you just, it, it's just ingrained and no one can tell you. <laughs> you, you just, you're just not prepared for it. I, I don't think you just, it, it's just in there. Uh, this incredible love for your kids and yet your kids come up and they ask you for things don't they 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 come and they 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 ask you for you know whatever it may be and one of the determining things is, is that you know more about not only what they're asking of you but you know more about the situation you as the parent you know that if they're, if they're asking for chocolates all the time, there are health implications. You know, you're thinking about their future. You're thinking about what lays ahead of them. How are they going to function in life? You know, if they're asking to go somewhere, you know more about that area and that place about than what they know. You know, you've just been through life. You've experienced that. You know more, and this is what we find in God: is that God knows infinitely more about my situation than what I know. And I think one of the things that I, I'm going to use it as a comfort on myself today to say that I'm waiting. Yes, I'm waiting, but I, I, I'm putting myself in a place of I'm trusting that my Lord knows more than me. I, I'm, I'm getting out of the way and I'm saying he knows more. His knowledge is a comfort to me. The fact that he knows is a comfort to me. And so what we see with Jesus, Jesus simply, he does know more about me. And what he knows is that this is working for glory. I, I'm just so encouraged about the, the way that Jesus um, sort of interrupts this timeline with this word glory. Because I don't know if you've considered it yet, but this time of waiting, the last year and a half, could it be a time of glory? Could it be that what God is working towards is, is a plan for glory? Could it be that your life is a canvas of his glory, of his greatness? Um, I think you could, when you get a sense of this, it really does revolutionize your world because what Jesus is kind of saying is that this is an opportunity. Uh, this is not the end, but an opportunity. And maybe, <laughs> well, I'm going to just say that this is not the end. Coronavirus is not the end. Church online is not the end. You know, what you're going through is not the end. Glory is the end. What lays ahead of the believer is always glory. Paul says that our momentary light afflictions are working for me a far greater, a far weightier crown of glory. That's what I'm looking towards. That's what I'm working for. What does that tell us? That every moment of my life is, is filled with purpose, infinite purpose, incredible purpose. Every detail has a, has a meaning. It, it, God takes brokenness and he makes something whole, makes something beautiful out of it. Uh, is he doing that with you? Can you see that today? Can you see that what you're going through today is, is a moment of purpose, a moment of you know, maybe destiny or whatever you want to call it. It's a moment where God is saying, I've put something in front of you that is so wonderfully glorious and you don't realize it now, but this is going to change your world. This is going to change the church. This is going to change your life. This is going to change your family. And, and if we're ready for it, um, I said that the Exodus journey is a great, great one for us to keep in mind. And we would notice on the Exodus, Exodus journey what they continually did 
is they complained. <laughs> they, they, complete, they continually said to God, we want to go back. <laughs> and I think, isn't that, you've been tempted to say that, don't lie, you, you want to go back. You want to go back to the way things were. But Jesus is saying, you've got to go forward. You've got to press on. I've got something laying ahead of you that is, is a promised land. It's, a, it, it's something much more glorious. And, uh, you know, I, I'm just thinking about the disciples, those who have heard Jesus say this. And you'll see that later on next week when I get into this a bit more. But you'll see that this phrase <laughs> that is going, that I'm going to do something glorious, you know, they heard it and it probably just sounded like nice words. Yes, yeah? so it, it sounded like something too good to be true. It sounded like something just out there and they didn't really take it to heart. <laughs> and this is the exodus. This is our life. It is, it, this is our struggle is to take the things of God to heart. I think the people that are going to rise out of this this year and a half that we have, the businesses that are going to rise, the churches that are going to rise, the people that are going to rise, the people that are right now saying, this is an opportunity. This is something that I need to, I, I need to be invested in and it's something that I'm, I'm looking at. What is God pulling apart? What is God stripping away from my life? What is God dealing with in my life? I need to get those things out. And what is God pointing me towards? Um, and this is, I mean, we've got history in this. Uh, my my dad, uh, I, I don't know when the year was, but got diagnosed with diabetes. And he said that was the best thing that happened to him because since then he's just had a much healthier lifestyle, exercising, eating healthy, you know, just feels full of joy. He told me the other day that he expects to live beyond 99, beyond 100, you know, he's just feeling so good. And and I, and I think that the, the, there are people that have lost their jobs. They said it was the best thing I got fired from that because now I'm doing my own business. Now I'm and that's, that's what we see time and time again throughout our human experience. And I would say that God is saying this, but infinitely more glorious than, than any of those things. Okay, so Jesus says this, this is working for your glory. It's working for the glory of God. And, and that is an important part to distinguish here is because what I am not saying is I'm not giving you a motivational talk about how you're going to be more glorious you're going to grow out of this. You're going to be a better person out of this. Sure, all those things are true. And I hope those, those things come to pass. But the key to this is that the glory of God, that God would be here, that God would be revealed, that God in his essence, in his, Moses said, God, we don't want to go any further than this. Show me your glory. Don't go without us, but show me who you are. I want to know who you are. I want to experience you. And that's what I believe that this time has bringing us to is to the point where we fall at him where we we're we're bowing down before him where the glory of God um, shines in our land and in our churches and in our lives and and friends we need that we really do need it I want to point out just this this one little detail that we could easily miss is that Mary and Martha they took word to Jesus they took it to him they said we need to tell our master about this. And this is just the, I guess, the principle of prayer. One of the reasons uh, I, um, I'm going to be a little bit bold and saying this, but could it be that one of the reasons why I don't know that he loves me, that I don't, I'm not assured that he knows more than me, is because I'm just not spending the time in prayer. Could I, could I be so bold as to press that to you and saying, perhaps in your life right now, you just, the times with the Lord that you used to enjoy, the times of scripture and the times of prayer, these disciplines that are so important, maybe those things are just drifting out of your life. The cares of this world are starting to eat up the good, the good word that's in you. And maybe all that, one of the things that you could do is just now take it back to Jesus. Take your concerns, take your worries, take your hurts, um, take it to him. It could be the best thing that happened. But one of the complex things is here is that they did that and Jesus still delayed. There was still a time of waiting. But let us see what Jesus does do because after he waits, after he waits, he goes to, uh, says to his disciples, let's go back to Judea. And 
the disciples said, don't you remember? <laughs> Just in the last chapter, <laughs> we, they were throwing stones at you. They tried to kill you. You want to go back there? Jesus says, yes, I do want to go back there. And I'll tell you why I want to go back there, because I'm walking in the light. Look what he says. Are there not 12 hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of this world. But if one walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. This is the, uh, so our waiting is not an idle waiting. Uh, you know, what Jesus is saying is, I'm going to go, I'm going to do the thing that I am called to do. I am walking in the purposes of God. God has uh, set a time for me in which to work the works of God. And I'm going to do that work. And he says, as for evil, as for the things that come against me, he says, as for people that would try and kill me in his case, he's saying they're walking in the darkness. And you know what happens to everyone who walks in darkness <laughs> eventually. You trip over something, eventually you stub your toe on something. And I would say to you, do not be distracted by things that seem to be of darkness. Do not be distracted by things that seem to be evil. Do, do not be so caught up in that fear-mongering um, sort of atmosphere that you're thinking that all oh, these things are going to come against us. This is going to be the end of everything. No, I tell you, everyone who walks in the darkness stumbles. <laughs> As Jesus said, be encouraged by these words. But I think that there is also a principle for us is that we ought to walk in the light. Um, we need to not have an idle waiting. Don't use this time just sitting back on your couch and, not, and just saying, well, I'll just wait for the lights to go back on and then I'll... No, you need to get this light inside of you. This light needs to... Did you notice this a really interesting phrase? When Jesus says about those who some, he says, because the light is not in them. It's not, this is, the, this is the light I need to get. I need to get a light in me. What's that saying? That means that somewhere in my heart and in my mind, a light needs to come on. A hope needs to come on. A resilience needs to come on. Okay, so we are... Well, so far, I've just said, put your trust in the love of God. Put your trust in the fact that he knows more and pursue the things that he's called you to do. And those are all great action steps for us. But I want to see here that all of these things are pointing directly towards Jesus. Because one of the things that I notice about this is that Jesus is going here at the risk of his own life. Look at the love that he has for Lazarus. That he's saying, I know they try to stone me but I'm going back there at the risk of my own life. I know that it's got, not going to go well for me, but I'm going anyway. Look at that love. Uh, um, look at the uh, uh, way he comes to us and he uh, is, is just so determined to meet us and to reach us no matter what it costs him. What we've been doing over the last few weeks is really using the gospel taking the gospel and we're applying it to our hearts and to our lives. And do you see the gospel here? Is because in this little short passage, we see that Jesus is going at the risk of his life. But what has he done for us? What has he done for us? When, when John talks about the glory of God, he's talking about the cross. Um, there's a passage of scripture um, in John's gospel, chapter 7, verse 39. That says, for the Holy Spirit was not given because Jesus was not yet glorified. You know, all the, God, all the commentators say that when Jesus said the Holy Spirit not been given because Jesus not been glorified, he's talking about the cross. He's talking about when Jesus saw the cross, he saw his glorification. He saw that in this, in this most devastating situation, I'm gonna reveal myself. I'm revealing the love of God. What is this saying to us? See. What has Christ done for us? When we look at the cross, when we're, we're in our time of waiting right now, but what we ought to do is be looking at the cross. Because when I look at the cross, I see a Jesus who not only came at the, at the risk of his life, you know, just risking his life, he came at the end with the cost of his life. He came and he gave everything for me. Do you think, do you think that he's going to let your life just 
go on the way it is? Do you think that, that he's going to leave you abandoned when this is the kind of thing he does for us in the cross? No, the cross teaches me. It teaches me that he will come to me. It teaches me he has come to me. It teaches me he gave everything for me. You think a jar of oil, a jar of perfume is all that Jesus is going to bring for you? No, Mary poured out the oil. Jesus pour, poured out his blood for us. You, you, you drive that into your heart while you wait that he will come. As sure as the morning, <laughs> the psalmist said, as sure as the day breaks, he comes. He will come. Uh, so let me close just on this last little phrase, verse 11. He says, our friend Lazarus sleeps, but I go to wake him up. <laughs> has, Jesus, <laughs> has Jesus come to wake you up <laughs> today? Are we asleep um, and we need waking up? This is, uh, I think, really prophetic it's a prophetic declaration over the church is that the church that sleeps, this time Jesus is using to wake us up. Get awake to him. Be awake to his glory. Be awake to his goodness. Be awake to his love and look for the opportunities that he's placed right in front of you. Neighbours, friends, family, kids, your wife, these are all opportunities right in front of us that we need to walk in the light, walk and do the works of God in our world. Let's close in prayer and commit our hearts and lives to the Lord. Lord, I thank you that you have allotted to us a time. You have set the boundaries of those time for us and you have given us a, a, a moment in time and I thank you that you have raised us up even for this moment in time that uh, that is just as Jesus said it is not unto death this is not the end but it is for the glory of God the son of God may be revealed that that Christ would be lifted up in these moments and in these times. And I pray for every heart to know the love of God. He loves us. He sees us as friends today. I thank you that our hearts will be comforted, that he knows more than us. Uh, and he certainly does. It, to the glory of God, we pray. Amen.